I was very excited to give an update at this meeting on the management of autoimmune cytopenias uh, in CLL patients in this era of targeted agents. And there's really kind of like uh, two aspects to this that I wanted to cover for the talk. One of the most important aspects is just understanding the impact of any new CLL therapy on concomitant autoimmune cytopenias. The information we have is mainly on autoimmune hemolytic anemia and ITP, and really there's not too much um, new out there in pure red cell pleasure or autoimmune neutropenia. So I focused on the first two. Uh, I'm sure everyone's aware that uh, fludarabine as a single agent was thought to precipitate these. And since this is an important complication of CLL, it's just something you always got to think about with any new therapy. The really interesting uh, updates uh, that I thought uh, were kind of most relevant was looking at the incidence of these autoimmune cytopenias occurring during um, treatment with our CLL-directed targeted agents, and then also looking at what happens to patients with chronic autoimmune cytopenias if they start taking one of our neurotargeted agents. So the CLL-focused targeted agents of interest these days, of course, are BTK inhibitors, PI3 kinase inhibitors, and then venetoclax. And uh, in terms of BTK inhibitors, there's much more information on ibrutinib because it's been around for longer and it takes a duration of experience with it before we start looking at kind of autoimmune cytopenias and uh, what happens with those. So so um, both the uh, BTK inhibitor ibrutinib and uh, idelisib have a lower incidence of uh, yeah. a kind of treatment emergent autoimmune cytopenias. And that was actually looked at in a couple studies. So the most recent look at this was a, a study by Vitaly et al. And they actually broke it down to ibrutinib, idelisib, and venetoclax in terms of the incidence and reported it as cases per thousand patient years of exposure. And so for ibrutinib, that was five. For idelisib, that was six. And for venetoclax, that was 69. Um, so it's really uh, quite a higher amount with venetoclax, and that was statistically significant in terms of there being more. So it's not really a reason not to use venetoclax. It's just something else we've learned about that agent. Um, our institution had previously looked at our experience with uh, treatment emergent autoimmune cytopenias with ibrutinib, and we had an incidence of 13 per thousand patient years. Um, we also had 25% of those patients uh, roughly having autoimmune cytopenias prior to starting ibrutinib or having ever experienced them, it was a heavily pretreated high-risk cohort. And we included um, people with relapsed autoimmune cytopenias in that number. And Vitale actually did it very cleanly where they only um, looked at patients that had never had an autoimmune cytopenia. So that might account for the difference between kind of like the 13 and the five and six. Either way, venetoclax is more. And uh, the theory behind this would be that inhibition of B-cell receptor signaling um, actually decreases these antibody mediated um, kind of autoimmune cytopenias. And actually, BTK inhibitors are also developed in different autoimmune diseases based on their immunologic effects. So that all kind of makes sense. And it's nice to see this confirmation. PI3 kinase inhibitors also, of course, inhibit uh, B-cell receptor signaling. So it's probably why you're seeing the same. Um, the good news is in that study, um, really, it looked like there was a beneficial effect on ongoing or chronic autoimmune cytopenias with any of the agents starting. And in the venetoclax case, likely due to better CLL control. So it really isn't at all discouraging of using any of these drugs. Um, and this is across multiple studies. You see an improvement usually in chronic AIC. Um, we looked at this in our study. Um, Dr. Hempel at Mayo Clinic looked at that in a study of non-clinical uh, trial patients, ours clinical trial patients. You know, Vitale has looked at this. And it really looks like you do get autoimmune cytopenia control for people with chronic ongoing AIC when you start um, mostly BTK inhibitors and then in the Vitaly series, venetoclax. I think what this really means for the field is that um, overall, if you have people with chronic autoimmune cytopenias, you treat those um, you know, kind of distinctly from the CLL. And that makes sense when you're first treating them as some of them can be completely eliminated and not relapse after treatment with steroids and rituximab. However, in the cases of chronic autoimmune cytopenias, it might actually be better to consider starting CLL drugs therapy with a, with a targeted agent, you know, either a BTK inhibitor, PI3 kinase inhibitor, or venetoclax earlier to avoid chronic toxicity and more and more immunosuppression in this population that's already susceptible to infection.
reactions. So it might be wise to move kind of CLL directed therapy with these targeted agents earlier into your kind of treatment scheme for autoimmune cytopenias. Um, and, you know, also to study these, uh, you know, kind of prospectively earlier in that course would be a very valuable thing. The other thing I wanted to mention that I talked about was not just our CLL directed targeted therapies that are antineoplastic treatments and how they impact autoimmune cytopenias and CLL, but also targeted agents being developed in primary autoimmune cytopenias that might benefit our patients. There's actually been quite a bit of work done in this area recently um, by by, by people that, that do work in ITP and autoimmune hemolytic anemia as primary disorders, not as uh, CLL-associated conditions. Um, and so the two drugs of interest, I think right now, are fosfamatinib, which is a sick inhibitor. Um, not only does it inhibit B-cell receptor signaling by inhibiting sick in that um, cascade, but also inhibits FC receptor-mediated clearance of antibody-coated cells by macrophages. And in mouse models, they've demonstrated very nicely that fostamatinib can actually block the clearance of antibody coated cells um, using a passive uh, model of both ITP and autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Fostamatinib is FDA approved for chronic ITP and is actually in phase three uh, testing for autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And we had the phase two study open. It can be very effective. And I think that kind of therapy should be something that we study in our CLL patients. There's also a BTK inhibitor called brisabrutinib that has the same kind of effect on macrophages that is now in phase three testing for ITP. So I, I do think that the CLL community um, should continue to uh, follow these kinds of things closely and work together with some of the uh, kind of um, benign hematology community working on uh, therapies for primary ITP and AIJ to see how we might best study or translate some of those advances to help our patient population. I think we all know that autoimmune cytopenias can be more devastating than the actual effects of the leukemia for a subset of our patients. And so continued work in this area, not only to look at how our CLL treatments affect autoimmune cytopenias, but also to look at what new treatments um, we we can bring to our patients with CLL-associated ITP or autoimmune hemolytic anemia is really important.